All right. Good evening, everyone. Welcome again to our Bay Area Home Buyer Workshop. Um, so this is going to be kind of information to help guide you as first-time home buyers. The, the the market data is going to be kind of Bay Area focused, but you know we probably have some audience members joining us from Southern California or the Sacramento area. That's totally fine. Uh, a lot of kind of the basic framework of first-time home buyer uh, home buying will be included in tonight's uh, discussion. But we'll do kind of some market statistics on the Bay Area. You know, I think given what's going on in today's market, I think now's a great great opportunity to kind of just learn a little bit more as first time home buyers whether you're you know looking to buy before the end of the year or you're kind of getting yourself uh, in position to have some financial goals for next year i think now's a great time to kind of train up and learn what the market looks like and there is some opportunities out in the market especially for our first time home buyers and you're going to learn a little bit more about that tonight um, as we go through tonight's discussion just a little quick a uh, little bit about me um, i get a chance to help facilitate and teach these classes uh, every couple of weeks um, in different markets that we serve across california and in other states the concentration is primarily around first-time home buyer ownership. So we're going to learn a lot about, you know, credit, uh, down payment, assistance programs, and whatnot. So that's kind of our specialty. Uh, we partner with Cal HFA. In fact, some of you may have connected with me through that. Cal HFA is the California Housing Finance Agency. You're going to learn a little bit about some of the products tonight offered through Cal HFA, uh, but we'll also talk about some other different programs. So um, we get a chance to, like I said, broadcast this information every couple of weeks in Zoom format. And I work one-on-one -on -one with clients in a consultation to develop home buying game plans. Okay. Now, tonight's discussion looks a little bit like this. We're gonna look at the housing market, kind of barrier area focused, as I mentioned earlier, talk a little bit about interest rates. Uh, in just a minute, we're gonna do a rent versus buy analysis. So, so we're gonna take a scenario of looking at what it looks like today versus on a rent situation versus what it could be in a buy situation. We'll talk a little bit about credit, how to maximize our credit to improve our purchasing power. We'll look at student loans, different loan programs that are available to you as buyers. Um, some of the documentation required in home ownership, uh, the assistance programs offered through Cal HFA, and then we'll wrap up tonight's discussion looking at the process of buying. We call it the six steps of home buying, and we'll kind of take you from what does it look like to be pre-approved and then start your home shopping journey all the way to actually getting the keys to your house, okay? Um, so we'll take you through all of those um, talking points in tonight's session. And as we jump in and launch into tonight's um, workshop, you know, looking at home buying and taking, first of all, you're taking the time out of your busy schedules to actually join us to learn a little bit about this and kind of all the craziness that goes on our day to day. You know, that's it's, it's an important first step in figuring out what home ownership could look like for you because it's probably going to be one of the largest investments you make in your lifetime. Um, so getting kind of everything in order financially for yourselves, I think, is a and just understanding what the resources look look like is a really important first step. Um, the benefits of owning a home look a little bit like this. I mean, it's, it's not like paying, you know, rent every month. So you're actually paying something into ownership. So you're creating stability in your house payment. This is an asset. So you have the ability to be able to pass along the asset to heirs of your estate. Um, you create equity and several of our buyers, hundreds of buyers that we've helped over the last two, three years, especially have seen massive equity growth um, because, you know, the market has taken off so quickly. Um, and there's still some great potential tax benefits that come with home ownership. And so, you know, the ability to be able to not only control a budget, but also be able to have an investment for a lifetime um, of financial wealth growth is huge. And I think as we prepare for home buying, um, it's really important for us to develop a budget and figure out what home ownership could look like for us. So I'm going to take you through a rent versus buying calculator um, so we can get a sense of, you know, what does it look like? to, you know, step step in or step away from, you know, currently renting to going into home ownership and what does that comparison look like for us? So um, this is a, a, a calculator brought to us by Freddie Mac. And by the way, all the material that I share with you this evening, we're going to go ahead and, and send it out to you via email. So you'll get the deck page that we go through tonight. And then um, what we'll do is, uh, you know, if you do have any follow-up questions, we can certainly answer those as you receive that material. Um, so let's, let's, Put in a scenario here um, of we'll, and we're going to assume monthly rent of let's say thirty five hundred dollars a month, okay? Um, and then we're going to say monthly renters insurance is fifteen dollars. So as we know, renters insurance is going to cover the contents of our our rental property. Um, we'll assume our rent's going to go up about three percent per year. And then on a home purchase, um, now we're, we're primarily looking at with barrier prices. Now we have barrier clients that are purchasing as low as three hundred thousand up to a million. We're going to go ahead and target around 800,000 um, as a purchase price. Now, typically at 800,000, 
the minimum down payment is probably going to be about 5% um, for a home purchase. Okay, so let me just go ahead and change that up really quick. So we'll put 5% in. Um, and then um, and then property tax wise, generally um, taxes are going to be anywhere between 1% to 1.25% of this purchase price. We just put a round number in of 10,000. You know, some counties are a little bit more expensive than others. For example, Alameda County can be a little more expensive from a tax perspective. Uh, and that might look a little different than say Santa Clara County, for example. But let's let's go ahead and put 10,000 for our property taxes. We have homeowner's insurance, which is gonna insure the, the exterior and interior of the home. Uh, we wanna assume maintenance. Um, you know, when, when we're carving out our budget, we wanna make sure we allocate some funds for, um, you know, anything that could happen to, to pop up. And, you know, maybe that's the hot water going out of our house, or maybe we've got a roof leak. Those are all things we wanna take into consideration from a maintenance perspective. And then we'll plug in loan information. Um, so usually with most financial products, especially for first time buyers, we're gonna be looking at a 30 year fixed mortgage. Um, we're gonna assume an interest rate. Now interest rates have crept up and we're gonna talk a little bit about that in just a second. We're gonna put plug in like 6.875 right now, just because of kind of where we've seen the market go uh, recently. Uh, we'll talk about kind of what that means to you as a consumer in just a bit. Origination charges, those are going to be costs that you're going to be paying to a lender that originates your financing of your loan. Um, there's discount points, and we have that at zero right there, but especially in a rising rate environment, we're starting to see more clients that are maybe thinking that paying discount points could work better for them in structuring their, their financing. What a discount point is, is it's usually a point equals 1% of your loan amount. And that one point generally will bring down your interest rate, say a quarter percent. It, you know, it depends on the day in the market, what the financial markets look like, but usually that's kind of the rule of thumb. One point or 1% 1 of your loan amount equals a quarter percent reduction in interest rate, okay? Um, and then other settlement charges, we have 5,000 here. That could be a, a, a little bit higher. The overall closing cost that we would say, you know, a client should budget for would be anywhere between 2% to 3% of their sales price. So that's inclusive of lender fees, title, escrow, what we call as prepaid items. All of that would be factored into closing costs. And then the other assumptions we want to make is appreciation rate of our home. We're going to assume the home goes up maybe 3% a year. Um, obviously, some of our current homeowners have seen 10 to 12% increases, but we don't want to project these high numbers. We want to kind of, you know, kind of project really what's realistic on a long term. And then we're going to put expected years in the home about seven years. Uh, the selling cost, 10%. How we come up with that number is just a generalization of saying, okay, when we sell our home, we're going to be responsible for not only paying the realtor fees for the selling agent that represents us as an owner, but also the buyer's agent that represents the buyer. Now, what's nice about that is you being new first-time buyers, when you have a realtor that represents you, you don't have to pay their commissions. Those are always paid for by the seller in California. Uh, we're going to plug in state and federal taxes at 33.8 and then a savings rate of 1%. So what this calculator does is it, is it basically says, okay, if we're gonna look at our payments for the next seven years, um, we're gonna, we're gonna, let me just switch tabs here. Um, you know, from a rent perspective, we know we're spending $3,500 a month in rent. In home ownership, that's gonna go up dramatically to like $6,600 a month. But with that change in our monthly budget, we do have an opportunity over seven years to, to basically have about a $35,000 opportunity over seven years. And that's taken a very conservative approach in equity growth um, and, you know, really kind of what ultimately that home will do for you. And then, you know, when we look at that, we also look at tax deductibility too. So potential tax deductibility of interest. And of course, with rents continuing to be on the rise, you know, that 3% adjustment that we've accounted for probably looks a little bit higher, um, especially for some of our clients that are purchasing in, in some of our more expensive markets. Um, so that's the buyer versus rent analysis. Again, you're going to have the opportunity to be able to kind of do your own calculation um, as we send out this material back to you tomorrow. Okay. All right. Let's go ahead and uh, move along. and jump back into our slideshow. Um, okay. So let's take a look at housing appreciation. Um, and this analysis is looking at Alameda County. I know many of you are probably joining us from Contra Costa or San Mateo or, or, or uh, Santa Clara County, um, but we're just going to kind of take a look at Alameda County over the last 12 months. You can kind of see what home values have done uh, in the last 12 months. And, you know, really 
what we're what we're kind of really looking at right now is is what we have here in the in the most recent two to three months. Especially our clients in you know in the in Q1 Q2 really had some challenges trying to get into the market because the market was a red hot market still. Interest rates were still relatively low, four and a half maybe five percent. As we've seen rates go past the six percent mark and now you know venturing into the seven percent range, that has changed buyer demand. But what it's also caused is homes to stay on the market longer. Um, so you know as you're seeing homes stay on the market longer. 30, 40 days, you're also seeing sellers that are anxious to sell. So you're seeing price cuts and that's made it a more attractive uh, market for first time buyers. Um, now we do understand that obviously interest rates are a lot higher. So that does change our purchasing power. So we have to take that into consideration, but to have a, a much more um, easy entry point to home ownership with lower prices is becoming much more favorable for our buyers. Because if you think about it, you know, your sales price of your home is kind of the long-term investment, right? So whatever I purchase in my, my home values is really what I'm set at. However, with interest rates, interest rates can vary over time. And many of our clients that have purchased over the last five, six, seven, eight years have gone through what we call as a refinance. And a refinance allows you to be able to lower your rate at some period of time. So like everything, you know, real estate prices will cycle, interest rates will cycle, um, we don't know when that will occur, but the opportunity to think for a first time buyer is if I can get in the market when it's, you know, maybe a little bit of struggles out there and price cuts and I have a lower price, it, when rates eventually come down, um, maybe that's the opportunity for me to refinance my home at that time. Um, you know, when we look at the economy right now, there is some signs pointing to a possible recession. And with those kind of recessionary indicators, um, you know, we could see, you know, money moving out of the stock market back into real estate, and that can uh, change the competitive climate in real estate. So I think it's something as first time buyers, we definitely should take into consideration. Now, when we look at interest rates, and you can see the blue line here on interest rates representing kind of this, this kind of really swift move up north on interest rates, we've seen interest rates move to that 7% level now, and really a, a steep incline over the last two, three months. Um, what's driving a lot of that is kind of what you and I are facing on a day-to-day -day basis. The cost of everything is more expensive. Um, we're in an inflationary environment and the Federal Reserve is trying to get control of the cost of everything by raising interest rates. And so mortgages have also obviously been impacted by that as well. So that's kind of what you're seeing in the market right now. Um, now, where does that end? We just don't know. I mean, the market remains very volatile right now, um, you know, based upon economic news that comes out. Um, in fact, the Federal Reserve posted their meeting minutes today that helped improve interest rate markets a little bit, but it was very subtle. The, the consumer wouldn't really see that. But at, in, within the industry, we do see kind of those little subtle movements. Um, so that improved the market a little bit. But you know, we don't know exactly where we're going to land and when we will see interest rates start to come down. Some of our forecasts show the interest rates could come down the first of the year. Um, but I think a lot of this is going to be dependent upon what happens with our economy in terms of if we do go into a recession and what you know what that brings to us from an interest rate perspective. Obviously, the the, la the previous two years and what we saw in the pandemic um, brought interest rates to all time lows. We saw, and you can see represented in in, in our slide here. You know, rates as low as 2.6%, um, created a, a fury of refinancing and really helped fuel some home buying, um, which obviously created a competitive climate. And now we've seen that competitive climate shift a little bit. So no longer are we in that seller's market that we saw where sellers were demanding top prices. Now we're seeing more kind of a shift to buyer's market, okay? Now, when we look at interest rates, um, not all interest rates are the same because they do vary by a few different characteristics. There's credit scores will make up the interest rate offering, the type of loan that you're going to select, uh, how much you finance, how much you decide to put down. So whether I put 3% down or 20% down, that could change the opportunity for my interest rate. Uh, we mentioned it earlier about discount points. Um, so the cost that you decide to pay to potentially buy down your interest rate, uh, which is becoming a little bit more, um, you know, part of what we're seeing in the market. Um, that uh, that cost that you pay, discount points, as you as you remember, that one percent of your loan amount is usually that one point will generally uh, create a reduction in your interest rate of about a quarter percent. Okay, 
And then term is the other characteristic that can change your interest rate. So most first time buyers are gonna utilize a 30 year fixed mortgage. Um, but let's say you decide to take advantage of a 20 year loan or maybe 15 year loan because you wanna pay off your mortgage quicker, that could potentially create a lower interest rate. Now, as we go through a consultation with you, and that's one of our, our kind of our steps in building a home buying plan for you, we'll kind of figure out what the right budget looks like for you, go through interest rate options and product selections. And so that's kind of part of our job to kind of design the right financing tool for you. Uh, now, in building that financing or home buying plan for you, credit comes into play. That's one of our discussions we're going to have as part of a consultation. And what we want to want to do with credit is just make sure that we're in the best possible position to get the optimal product for us. And every product that a lender offers has minimum credit score guidelines. So for an FHA loan, there's a minimum score of 580. Conventional loans at 620. VA at 620. And then for that first time buyer program options that we discussed earlier, or we're going to actually review, I should say later on, it's usually a minimum credit score of 640 for an FHA loan, 680 for a conventional loan. Okay. When we think about conventional loans, we're going to connect that to Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac loans. And then our FHA VA loans are going to be more of our government supported loans. Um, so that again, has a minimum credit score of 580 for FHA 624 VA. Now, when we look at the FICO score calculation model, I'm going to kind of take you this part of the slide. 15% of it's going to be how long I've had credit. So the more mature my credit file is, uh, the higher my potential credit score could be. 20% is going to be how long I've had credit in use. And then how also, how much new credit am I trying to obtain? So if you've had a lot of hard inquiries recently, or you've opened up a lot of new accounts that could impact your credit score because it's it's 20 percent of the overall credit weighting now when we start our process to design a home buying plan for you our team starts with a soft credit score so that doesn't impact your credit score and then eventually as we get down the road and maybe have an accepted offer for a home that's when we'll go ahead and complete a hard inquiry uh 30 is going to be how much i owe now that's also known as credit utilization uh, credit utilization is um, attributed to where your credit card balances are at versus where the credit balance is. The credit, I'm sorry, credit limits are at versus where your credit balances are at. Um, and so that's 30% of the weighting. And generally in our consultations, that's probably the topic that you know we have to kind of dive into most. Um, now, when you look at your credit card balances, the balance that's on those credit cards gets posted at the end of your billing cycle date. That's what the information goes out to the credit bureaus. So we always encourage our clients to try to pay down or pay off your credit cards before the end of your billing cycle date, because that's going to give you the best shot at having the lowest possible utilization to help give you the maximized credit score. So again, utilization is going to be your credit limits versus your credit balances. So if I have a $10,000 credit limit and I have $5,000 in balances on that card, that means I have a 50% utilization. If we're maybe trying to just or maybe we're making the minimum payment on our credit cards and it's a little bit of a struggle to pay down our balances. Our goal should be at least to get below 50% utilization. If you've already kind of mastered that and now you're just at a place where you're just trying to get to a zero balance, then I would say try to get below 10% utilization. That'll give you the most kind of uh, improvement to your credit score. And then 35% is going to be payment history. That's basically how I've paid my bills. Um, so obviously, if I have on-time payments, then I should have you know a great, great score that'll be supported by that 35%. Now, if I've had some past challenges, like a late payment, maybe a collection just popped on my credit report, when that has occurred in the last 12 to 24 months, that's going to be the most impactful to your credit score. So as you move further out away from that 12 to 24 months, then you should start to see that score go up for you. Okay. Um, count closure, I want to kind of talk a little bit about that. That has to do with revolving accounts. So if you decide to you know, close out an account, you, what happens when you close out, a, especially long-standing accounts if you had for a long time, that could hurt the length of credit, how long you've had your credit. Um, and then additionally, it could also impact your amount owed because if I get rid of a credit card that I've had for you know, 15 years, I lose that credit limit, but all that great history that I've had over the last 15 years gets pulled away from the credit model. So you, you wanna be really careful before you start closing out accounts. And then in lending, we pull, eventually we do a hard inquiry. We pull three, uh, we throw a pull at a three merge bureau. And what that means is three uh, agency credit scores. So there's Equifax, Experian, and then there's TransUnion. So we take the middle score of all three of those bureaus. So 
if I'm a borrower and I have a 720 is my highest score, 700 is my middle score, and 680 is my lowest score, 700 is the score that we'll use for qualifying purposes. Now, let's say I'm applying with my partner. Now, my partner has a 750, 740, and 720 score. Well, my partner has a 740 score, but in financing, we take the lowest middle score between both borrowers. So in that case, that would be my, what, 700 credit score. Okay. All right, any questions so far on credit that I can help answer for every, for the audience? Okay, we got a quiet group tonight. Hopefully I'll get some questions, but um, you know, usually stuff comes up around credit and you know, these are tools to help you kind of maximize your credit score and improve your finances for your upcoming home purchase. Now, if you've had some past challenges, like some negative items that have shown on your credit report, this matrix kind of shows you how long they'll stay with you. So those hard inquiries will be on your credit report, you know, at least two years. Um, if you've had any late payments, it's seven years. The impact to your score will be in, in the most recent 12 to 24 months, but those late payments will stay on your credit report for seven years. Okay. And then you can see also, you know, federal records like bankruptcies, um, federal debt that generally be on your credit report indefinitely. Um, now, student loans, speaking of federal debt, um, you know, those are things that generally will come out in a consultation and we'll kind of talk through those with our, our buyers. I realize that there is um, debt forgiveness that's that's going to be allocated for our, our federal student loan holders, and that hopefully will come down very soon. Um, as it stands right now, we still have to qualify our clients with the existing student loan balance debt, so that would still be in place. But eventually, hopefully, when that those balances get reduced, I think it's up to ten thousand dollars, if I'm not mistaken, um, then that will be a, a, something that will be adjusted off your student loan balance, and of course, change your monthly payment. So while the federal student loans are still in forbearance, we still have to count a minimum payment for you in qualifying. Um, and when we look at a conventional loan, the default calculation is 1% of the balance that we have to calculate for your payment. Now, if you have an income-based repayment amount, whatever that amount was prior to the pandemic, that's the amount we're gonna use for qualifying. For FHA loans, the default is 0.5% of your balance. But like I said, if you've been in an income-based repayment amount prior to the pandemic, that's the amount that we would use for qualifying. So um, generally speaking, it's going to be more helpful for our clients if they're in an income-based repayment amount, because um, that's going to be allow us to have lower debt obligations and then hopefully be able to maximize the qualifying. Um, if you have a deferment right now in your student loans, we still have to count a balance. If you've just graduated from school and you have these balances, but there's no payment due, we still have to calculate what that estimated payment is going to be um, to factor that into your qualifying. So um, student loans, while they're, they may not be active, if they have balances, those do have to be included into the overall obligations. Okay, let's talk a little bit about loan programs now. So there's usually well, really kind of five core programs in financing. There's conventional loans, which will be Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac loans. Um, there's FHA loans, so Federal Housing Administration. Those are government sponsored loans. VA loans for our veterans that have served. USDA, which is going to be for more rural areas. Um, and then jumbo loans. Those are, those are usually going to be for loans that are going to exceed the maximum loan amount of 97800 Okay, and jumbo loans usually require 10 to 15% down payment. For most of our first time buyers, that's not going to be usually the first option. We're generally going to be looking at probably the conventional and FHA loans. Um, so when we look at these programs, as you learned earlier, they do have minimum credit score requirements. Um, the conventional loan has a minimum down payment of 3% if we go all the way up to a loan amount of 715. Um, now, once we exceed a loan amount of 17, a 715, that does require a minimum down payment of 5%. 715 is what we call the new conforming limit. Um, and that's been that's going to be adopted for 2023. But a lot of the lenders like APM have adopted this new loan amount in anticipation of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac changing uh, the loan limit uh, amounts. Okay. Um, before I go further on the loan loan side of it, I got a couple of questions that popped in um, on employment and student loans. So let me just kind of answer these on air uh, for our audience. And then um, did you answer the first question? Okay. Um, so first question was, what if I graduate in 2019 and found a job the same year? Would you still calculate based upon the income before the pandemic? So um, that's going to be a question more for your student loan servicer, I think. I think that's where your question is. 
we're going to use the whatever payment the student loan servicer is, is giving you as your income based repayment. That's what we're going to use for qualifying on the mortgage. So um, that'll be something you want to talk with your student loan servicer about. Um, and then another question about student loans, is there any impact if you receive an award that helps you pay off your loan, i.e. healthcare professional? Um, so yeah, so if you have a forgiveness option because you're in healthcare, um, that doesn't change um, anything from a qualifying perspective. Um, that's great, be, uh, but generally like with healthcare professionals, there's, a, there's kind of an end date when those things will be forgiven. So in the now, we still would have to count a minimum payment, but obviously long-term that'll help you uh, to alleviate that debt. And uh, next question that came in, is there any benefit of a first-time home buyer to put down more than a 3% down payment? Um, so we're gonna we're gonna tackle that question in a little bit, but just um, to answer it just high level really quick, yes, there is because it's gonna allow you to have cheaper mortgage insurance. So we'll talk a little bit about that in a second. Also, could potentially help lower your interest rate. Okay, all right, great questions. I appreciate everybody bringing those to us. Um, okay, let's get back to loan programs. Um, so, uh, like I mentioned, if you finance more than seven hundred fifteen thousand dollars, that's going to be, become a high balance loan. So then it requires a minimum down payment of five percent. Um, so that's on the conventional loan. FHA loans always a minimum down payment of three and a half percent, up to a loan amount of nine seventy eight hundred. By the way, just quick side note: so all of our loan amounts that we're talking with you uh, about tonight. Those are all based upon Bay Area county limits. So these limits change based upon the county. So if you're joining us from Sacramento County, your, your limits are going to be a little bit lower. Um, the conforming limit still stays across the country, which is 715000 but the high balance loan amount will change by county. Or if you're joining us from Central Valley, maybe you're in San Joaquin County, you're going to have a much lower uh, limit. So these limits are set every year by Fannie Mae based upon um, cost of living adjustments. Um, and in in median income, so so just you're aware of that. Uh, VA loans um, for our veterans that have served that's no down payment requirement. So generally, a buyer would just have to put closing costs out of pocket. Um, so if a VA a veteran is eligible for the VA product, they would have a certificate of eligibility, and we would build their financing around that. Uh, there's the USDA loan that's going to be for our uh, for our um, kind of rural areas. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, so that's going to be some of our areas in the northern part of the state, uh, you know, some of our foothill areas um, that has income limits on that program um, based upon the geography or the location of that particular property. And th then just real quickly with jumbo loans, jumbo loans are going to have a higher down payment amount. Um, so that's going to require a little bit more in assets from our, our buyers. But there's also a reserve requirement with jumbo loans. And usually a reserve requirement is additional assets that I have. So on top of my down payment and closing costs, having assets of usually 12, uh, 12 months of your monthly payment. So if I have a $6,000 mortgage payment and I have a 12 month reserve requirement, that means I need to have an additional $72,000 in assets, 401k, 403b, cash, brokerage account that I have on, on hand in addition to my down payment and closing costs. So that may make that particular financing a little more challenging for our first-time buyers, but most of, most of our first-time buyers are gonna be electing either a conventional loan or an FHA loan. Okay, let's talk a little bit about private mortgage insurance, which is also known as PMI. Um, and you know when we look at PMI, PMI is gonna be insurance for the, the mortgage lender for protection against default. Conventional loans have different tiers of mortgage insurance where FHA is just gonna have a flat mortgage insurance premium. Let's look at conventional loans because we had a question that came up earlier about, hey, if I put more than 3% down, is that gonna change uh, or is that a benefit to me as a first time buyer? Um, and the answer, like I said earlier, is yes. Um, and you know, when you look at PMI, there's different actually ways that you can pay PMI. There's monthly MI, there's a split MI where you can pay some of it upfront, some of it monthly. There's single premium where you can basically buy out the mortgage insurance. You can build mortgage insurance into your interest rate. That's called lender paid mortgage insurance. Not a super common option, especially right now with interest rates being higher. And then to the question earlier, PMI is based upon credit score, how much you put down. So if I accelerate that 3% to maybe 10% and then I finance less, my premium is going to be less. Um, that would benefit me as a buyer. And with conventional loans, there usually is a cancellation option. So when you have um, two years in the home and 20 to 22% equity, you can apply to have the mortgage insurance canceled. 
Um, if we look at a PMI option, which we have down here at the bottom, I realize these loan amounts are a little bit smaller, but the same logic will apply for a, a Bay Area buyer. If we're financing $450,000, um, let's say our credit score is 740 and we put 3% down, the average mortgage insurance is going to be about $183 a month. So some of your calculators that many of you that may use on Redfin or Zillow or whatever, aren't, um, they're not going to go, uh, they're not, uh, they don't have all the, the factors into the PMI calculation. So you generally get a much higher number. So they don't get as granular as we do in these calculations. So uh, we have a fantastic calculator that you're going to hear a little bit more about um, part of our mobile app. Um, that's a great way to kind of determine what your actual payment would be on a particular property. Um, FHA loans. Now this has just kind of more of a flat mortgage insurance premium. So it's always 0.85% of our loan amount. If we put three and a half percent down, if we decide to put 10% down, that factor drops to 0 0.80, but there will also be upfront mortgage insurance on an FHA loan, which is 1.75% of your loan amount. That gets financed into your loan, but nonetheless, it is increasing your balance um, as part of the upfront mortgage insurance. FHA does not have a cancellation option when you put three and a half percent down. Um, so you would have to probably refinance out of your FHA loan in order to maybe move to more of a conventional loan. Now, if we take the same 450 loan amount and we now we overlay that with FHA PMI, uh, the PMI and FHA would be $324 a month. And then, like I said, we have that 1.75 upfront MI, which is 7875. So, you know, that's that's kind of the ingredients to FHA financing. Now, when you kind of step back for a second, you may say, well, why would I go with FHA over conventional? It seems like, you know, the MI is higher. I have the upfront mortgage insurance. And it really depends for every client situation because each program has different guidelines and not all clients meet each of those guidelines. FHA, as you heard earlier, has a lower credit score threshold versus conventional. You know, FHA, if I've had a bankruptcy, would be okay if I'm two years out of a bankruptcy, whereas conventional loans would wanna see four years. Or let's say maybe I had some challenge the challenges and I had a foreclosed home. Conventional loans would want seven years out of a foreclosure where FHA could maybe have three to four years. So those little variations in guidelines may have a buyer look at one product or the other. Okay, let's look at documentation for income purposes. And I'll go kind of go through this really quick to keep us on time here. Um, for W-2 wage earners, we usually need uh, last two years of W-2s, 30 days of pay stubs, and then some type of verification of employment. And then for self-employed individuals, um, depending on your tax structure, um, if you're a sole proprietor, it's the last two years of taxes, then we'll see your Schedule C income, uh, profit and loss statement, probably a balance sheet, and then we just need to verify the business through a license or you know on online exposure or whatever it might be. Um, now, a couple of things that come up with income um, that we you know like to kind of share with our audience in our classes. Um, a few things, um, and I think we had, one of the questions actually kind of tails in right to what I was going to kind of share, which is you know if you have new employment. So let's say you know you've just graduated. Like I think I saw the question of graduating twenty nineteen. And now I'm entering the workforce. Some lenders will want you to have two years right on that job. Um, the rule actually is you just have to have two years in the workforce and or education. So if I you know, just graduated from Cal, for example, and I had a accounting degree for four years I spent at Cal, and now I'm working for Deloitte in the accounting field, um, with that educational background, I satisfy the two-year requirement. So I can use my earnings from Deloitte right away. Um, now, if I'm transitioning jobs, let's say I'm working for the state, but now I'm going to go work in the private sector, as long as I can, you know, show what my new earnings are going to be on the new job, I don't necessarily have to be on the new employment for two years. I can be starting day one and those earnings could potentially be used. Um, so those are some different things to think about. Now, um, if you're in a, a job or, or, or let me say, let me say in the health, healthcare industry, let's say you're working for two hospitals, for example. In fact, we talked to a client today that had this exact scenario. I've, I'm working for Kaiser, for example, and I've been there for a year, but then I'm working for, um, let's say, uh, Sutter um, for a year, and I maybe do 30 hours one employer, 20 hours of the other. In order to count both sources of income, I do have to show that I've been on both jobs two years consistently. So that's for kind of part-time income. If it's full-time income, um, we can account one of the employment sources, um, and that you know, doesn't have to be two years per se.
if you're doing a side uh, side job, let's say you're driving for Uber or um, or doing DoorDash or something like that, as long as you can show that you've been doing your full time job and then that uh, the alternative uh, work for two years consistently, then both sources of income can be used. Now, in some of the first time buyer programs that we're going to look at in just a bit, um, most of those programs are going to look at applicant income, not necessarily household income. So one of the things we talk about in those sessions is, you know, if you're applying with just one person's name, that's the only income that's used for qualifying. Um, and if we have a partner that has income in that partner is not going to be on the loan application, then that income is not counted against the income limits for the first time buyer programs. So we'll talk more about that in, in just a bit. Um, final thing before we leave income, I want to kind of talk a little bit about debt to income ratio. Uh, debt to income ratio looks at your gross monthly wages versus your monthly obligations. And those monthly obligations include things that are generally appear on your credit report, uh, credit cards, student loans, car loans, personal loans, and then we're also going to factor in the new mortgage payment. Usually, we don't want your monthly expenses to be more than 45% of your gross monthly income. So here's what the debt to income ratio calculation looks like. So I'll take into consideration the principal, the interest, the property taxes, and the homeowner's insurance for my house or my projected house. PMI, so the private mortgage insurance, if I'm buying a condo, townhouse, there'll probably be an HOA or homeowners association dues. So let's say that's $2,500 a month. And then if I have other expenses of $500 a month, that means my obligations are about $3,000. And then if I divide that by my gross monthly wages of $8,500, then my debt to income ratio is 35.29%. So most of our first time buyers feel really good around 33 to 36% to debt to income ratio. Obviously, in a higher cost of living market, we're seeing higher debt to income ratios pushing closer to 40 to 45%. I think at the end of the day, when we're having budget conversations, we're going to talk to you a little bit about, you know, what does that monthly expense look like? Does, how does that feel for you? Is that going to put you in a position where you feel like it's affordable for you? Because what our goal here in home ownership is to create sustainable and affordable home ownership. Um, and so that's why we want to kind of go through that exercise of really understanding more about your budget. Uh, now, from a down payment standpoint, that's the last thing we want to talk about in terms of qualifying. Uh, these are the acceptable sources of down payment. So checking and savings accounts, we can't use cash um, that is just recently deposited in accounts. All assets have to have a 60-day seasoning time period. Um, so if you do put cash in your account, that does have to season through a full two months of statements. Um, if we've had any like large deposits, those deposits all have to be sourced to their originating, um, originating place. Um, 401ks, 403bs, IRAs, those could potentially be used. You just want to check with your tax advisor, maybe your financial advisor, make sure you're not creating a tax implication for yourself, especially if you're accessing IRA funds or maybe a brokerage account. Now, gift funds are pretty popular, and especially for first-time homebuyers, that's when a family member has helped gift funds to you to achieve your down payment, maybe your closing cost requirement. Now, gift funds do not require a seasoning, so they don't have that same 60-day seasoning rule. Um, those can be transferred right away to the recipient or the borrower in this case. Um, and so there's a kind of a, a process for that. Generally, we need at least a gift letter. We'll need proof of their assets being in a financial institution, like utilizing a bank statement. And then we'll have to see proof of the transfer of funds. Okay, any questions on what we've covered so far in terms of income, uh, you know, anything around assets that we can uh, kind of answer for you before we jump into our first time buyer assistance programs? Okay, all right. All right, we're, we're at the home stretch here. Let's, let's talk a little bit about first time buyer programs. And, you know, as, as we all know, you know, preparing and saving for a home ownership is, is, is challenging. Uh, there's usually like two kind of key, I guess, challenges, if you will, for first time home buyers. It could be credit because we've had some, maybe some rough patches in credit, but more than likely it's just not enough savings for our down payment. Most people do still think they have to put 20% down to buy a house. Hopefully what you've learned so far in tonight's class is that, you know, you can put as little as 3% down. And in some cases, 3% down can be a little challenging too. So first-time homebuyer programs can be a, a great support and resource for you to achieve homeownership much earlier. 
And there's a few different programs that we help support uh, in partnership with CalHFA, which is the California Housing Finance Agency. Um, there's low, uh, low income housing products and there's moderate income housing products. So I'm gonna take you through a few of them and then I'm gonna give you kind of a, a quick look ahead of, of a program that's gonna be offered as well too. Um, the Equity Builder Program, uh, which is live right now, that's designed to help our low income housing buyers. We do a lot of work with this program in the Bay Area. Um, the Equity Builder Program provides up to 10% of your sales price in assistance. And what's really great about that program, it's forgivable after five years. Um, so you know, if you're buying a $600,000 house, 10% of 600,000 is $60,000. So you get $60,000 in assistance. For moderate income households, and, and by the way, for the equity builder program, for most Bay Area counties, except for Santa Clara County, the maximum income limit on that program is 120,000. Um, for clients um, in Santa Clara, you can make up to $133,000 on that product. For moderate income households, there's the My Home Assistance Program, which can provide up to 3% for a conventional loan, 3.5% for FHA, USDA, and VA loans. That's not forgivable, though. It does require to be repaid when you either sell the home or if you refinance in the future. And a quick look ahead at another program that actually we're going to be meeting with the state on next week is called the California Dream for All program. Some of you may have already seen some um, information out online on this program. It's still under construction. From a high-level perspective, what it provides is up to 20% in assistance um, but it's not forgivable. It does require to be repaid when you sell the home or if you refinance in the future. And they're still ironing a few of these details out, but it's going to more than likely have an equity share agreement. So as my home appreciates in value, so let's say I appreciate $100,000 in value, I could potentially have to pay back 20% of the equity gain at sale of my property. Now, this is going to have higher income limits than, say, the equity builder program because it's going to be based upon moderate income limits. Um, and so as we kind of get the rollout of the California Dream for All program, we're going to be giving more details out to our current clients as well as posting our social channels. So I'd encourage you, you know, follow us on Instagram or, or Facebook. Most, more of our stuff is on Instagram and you'll see kind of videos that we'll be posting on updates on that program. But we're probably about three to four months away. The Equity Builder program currently has about $21 million in funds left. And so that those funds, what we've projected, it will probably run out by the end of this year, early 23 the goal with the program is to be able to kind of move into California dream for all after the equity builder funds have been um, yeah, um, exhausted. So here's those income limits by county. So you have those for your reference. Um, so these will be all the low income housing um, income limits. These are all the uh, moderate income limits. The way assistance programs work, it, like I mentioned earlier in our income section, it is based upon the applicant income, not the household income. Most city-sponsored programs are going to be based upon your household income, where the state's just going to look at who has applied on the mortgage. Um, so let's talk really quickly about the forgivable equity program. So again, it's 10% of the sales price. Forgiven funds after five years, every year at one, one fifth of the assistance is forgiven. So you can refinance with these loans. Let's say you refinance in year three, then you would pay back three fifths of the assistance provided through the equity builder program. Now you can add funds in addition to the assistance. You can add up to 20% of your own funds and combine with the 10% you receive from the state. So you can put a total basically of 30% down. Now this assistance program cannot be combined with any other program. So it's just, it's a self-standing product. So you have the 10%, and that's what would be used towards your financing. So let, let's look at an example of what, what this could, what could look like for you. So um, this is gonna be on the, um, the moderate income product. Uh, let, me see, let me see how we did this. Um, so if we were to, let me just skip to one of our other slides here. Um, okay, so if we look at how this would apply to a home purchase, um, I'm gonna kind of improvise here a little bit. So we have an 850 sales price here. Um, if we were to take the 10% of sales price, we would have $85,000 in assistance. Um, when we do that, that assistance could be applied towards down payment or closing costs. So to kind of look up, look at the, the top of this slide here. So if we took an 850 sales price, the minimum down payment is 5%. So we could take that 10% um, assistance from the, from the program, apply that to our 5%, meet that requirement, and maybe use the additional funds for closing costs or we could increase our, our down payment. 
Most of our clients in the Bay Area, when we utilize this product, and which is a great scenario where they're able to put 10% of their own funds and then take the 10% from the equity builder program and achieve a full 20% down. What's great about that is that it enables a buyer to completely remove mortgage insurance from their home purchase. Okay, the moderate income product is the My Home Assistance Program that, that I mentioned earlier. Again, it's enabling you to borrow three to three and a half percent of your sales price. It is a low interest loan at 1% does not have to be paid back until you either sell the home or if you refinance in the future. Um, there is also the ZIP program. Um, the ZIP program right now is not active because of the current rate environment. I think when we see rates start to come down a little bit, then we'll probably see this program come back, uh, back to life. But uh, ultimately that 3% or 3.5% can be used to help fulfill the minimum down payment for you in your home purchase. So a great tool for you with the moderate income product. Um, now the eligibility requirements, I mentioned a little bit earlier about this. Um, the minimum credit score is 640 for an FHA loan, 680 for a conventional loan with CalHFA. Um, now on the equity builder program, it has a little bit lower credit score requirements. It's a 660 for conventional, 640 for FHA. The debt to income ratio that we talked a little bit about earlier, can go up to a 50% debt to income ratio if you have a 700 credit score or higher. Um, the income qualifications, we kind of talked a little bit more about this, was the it's based upon the applicant only. Um, and then a first time buyer is someone that hasn't owned in the last three years. Okay, so that's pretty important. So if you hold, sold your house in 2010 and now you want to re-enter the market, now you would be considered a first time buyer if you've rented in the last three years. Um, so single family homes are eligible, new construction, condos, townhouses, um, below market homes can potentially be eligible. And then manufactured homes are eligible, but they have to be on land that is owned. They can't be like a manufactured home in a park, for example, where you're leasing the land. Okay, any questions on the first time buyer program before we uh, start kind of talking a little bit about the process? Okay. All right, all right, guys. Um, so here's our six steps of home buying. And so I'm gonna kind of walk you through each one of these milestones. The first step is gonna be your pre-approval. Now the pre-approval is gonna be the output of a consultation. So we've designed a home buying plan and then we're gonna issue a pre-approval um, to you, which will be a certificate that you're gonna to utilize to be able to present your offer to a seller. Usually the pre-approval is good for 60 days. Now, if your home search takes longer than that, we can always recertify your pre-approval. And if we need to make any adjustments on your pre-approval, let's say you get pre-approved for 700,000, but you find a house for 600,000, we can always adjust those numbers for you. Okay, so step one is gonna be pre-approval. Step two is gonna be my, our house hunting. So that's where you're gonna connect with a realtor. Uh, that realtor is gonna help put you on maybe an online portal search. So different um, you know, properties that you're interested in or locations are gonna pop up in your search. Um, and then if you see some properties that you like, that realtor will help go and show you those properties. Now, if you decide to make an offer on a property, a realtor will help guide you through that offer and they'll actually present the offer to the seller for you. Now, we have a fantastic network of preferred realtors all across California. We can always introduce you to one of our preferred realtors or you can find someone on your own. I just think it's really important to have that representation of a realtor. Um, as you learned a little bit earlier this evening, realtors are paid for by the seller. So I always recommend taking advantage of that resource. Um, okay, let me just really quick, I'm going to jump back to the one of the assistance programs. A question came in, is there a fully forgiven program if I live in a house for a certain time? Is there a program to buy a multifamily home? So just to go back to the equity builder program, um, it is fully forgiven after five years. So if you remain in the home for five years, um, the assistance is completely forgiven. So one fifth of the assistance is forgiven every year. At year five, it's fully forgiven. Um, for multifamily properties, um, first time buyer programs don't really exist because multifamilies are gonna be more kind of to create passive income um, through investment of maybe the second unit of a property or third or fourth. So your first time buyer programs are only gonna be really focused around one unit properties. Okay, so step three of the process is gonna be once I have an accepted offer on a property. So that means we're gonna enter escrow. When we enter escrow, that process is usually gonna take 30 days. Sometimes it's as short as 20 days, but usually it's 30 days. So that means that a seller has accepted our offer. Um, we usually have two to three days to make an earnest money deposit into escrow. 
that's called that's a good faith deposit that we're making into the transaction to show the seller that we have a financial you know stake in the transaction. Um, then we're going to reach out to you within 24 hours of your acceptance to schedule your follow up call, and that's where we get a chance to meet with you back over on video again just to make sure you feel comfortable with the design of your financing. We're going to talk about interest rates, maybe registering you for the first time buyer program, uh, what's your closing costs look like. So you have a really transparent, clear look at your financing. Your realtor is probably going to order your inspections of your house. We're going to order the appraisal and then we're going to issue disclosures to you. So that all kind of happens in the first maybe three or four days of the transaction. Um, now here's what an earnest money deposit looks like. It's usually one to 2% of your sales price. Now, since we're talking about the barrier market, barrier sales or barrier deposits are usually 3%. Um, so it's a little bit going to be a little higher. Now, that money does count towards your total out of pocket expense, but it's held in escrow uh, while you go through the buying process or the escrow process, I should say. Now, within the home um, purchase or the real estate contract, there's a thing called contingencies. And two or three, four months ago in the Bay Area, you didn't see a lot of purchase transactions with contingencies. But as I mentioned earlier, the market has shifted from a seller's market to a buyer's market. So these contingencies are an added layer of protection for a buyer. And it gives you some time to do your due diligence as a buyer. There's the appraisal contingency, which basically supports you want to make sure the house is worth what you're buying it for. You have your inspection contingency that allows you and your realtor to do your full inspections. And then you have your loan contingency, which ensures that you have your financing in place. The contingency period usually is in the first 12 to 17 days of your contract. So if something goes awry during that period, you could potentially cancel the contract and still get your deposit back. Okay. Now, like I said, three or four months ago, you didn't always have that protection because it was such a seller demanded market. And some sellers just didn't want that, you know, possibility of a buyer canceling. But I think in this market, now it's a much more settled market. You have the chance to be able to look at different options design a contract that fits for you and makes sense that you're making a smart or smart purchase. Okay. So that's the contingencies. Step four is going to be processing and underwriting. That's where we do all the administrative work on the financing. Uh, your rate has been locked in by that time. We're verifying your assets. Uh, we're preparing everything to be reviewed by our underwriting team. And that'll take us to step five, where an underwriter has completed your loan approval. They issue an approval. There is some conditions that the underwriter is going to ask for. Our team will work with you on achieving those items. Um, that's usually going to be pretty simple things like maybe current pay stubs, updated asset statements. Maybe that's a gift letter because maybe you have your parents are helping you with your down payment. And by that time, once you have the loan approval, you're going to be at the end of your contingencies. So if you're comfortable with what you found in your inspections, your appraisal is okay, and you have your loan approval, then you'll go ahead and sign off on your contingency. And that tells the seller that you know, you've done your homework, everything feels good, and you want to move to the final stages. We're also going to issue to you at that time a final closing disclosure. That's going to give you a three-day cooling off period before you get to the final stage, which is called closing your loan. And that's where you get a chance to meet with a, a public notary. You'll be signing final documents in person. And by the way, all the documents uh, that you've signed up to that point are always going to be e-signature documents. And um, but at the at, and they can be in, they can be live documents too. But usually it's going to be e-signature, and then you'll sign final documents at closing. You'll wire in your funds that are due at that time. And then on the back end of everything, as a lender, once you've completed all your document signing, we're going to do one more final audit. And once that audit has been um, completed, we're going to wire in the funds for your first mortgage. And if you've elected any assistance programs, uh, you'll take them. We'll, we'll take uh, take care of that for you as well. That money gets reconciled by the escrow team. And once that money has been balanced to the seller receiving the funds they're supposed to, you contributing what you're supposed to as a buyer, then documents get recorded with the local county recorder's office. Uh, they usually record a grant deed that transfers ownership to you. And they also record a deed of trust, which is your agreement to repay the loan. And once that all gets completed and recorded, then you become the official owner of the property. And then you get a chance to high five and celebrate, take some pictures in front of your new house because it's, it's a huge accomplishment. Like I said earlier, probably going to be one of the biggest investments you make in, of your lifetime, for sure. One thing I forgot to mention in our process um, is that the first time buyer programs do require home buyer education separate from tonight's class. And so generally we recommend uh, those, those classes be taken by the time you have an accepted offer on a house. We'll, we'll get you some of the links for those, those classes as well too. Um, 
I'm going to answer a quick question before we move in and, and wrap up tonight's discussion. Um, so let me just read this really quick. Uh, so the question came up is, if we buy now at a 7% interest rate and then later rates drop, will there be a chance for us to pay the lower interest rate? Or are we stuck at 7%? So if you buy now, um, you know the opportunity is it's a more buyer-friendly market. Rates are higher. But you could purchase today and have the opportunity to refinance down the road. So that's, and some of you may have done it maybe with your cars that you have. So if you buy at 7%, you purchase a home for 600,000, five years from now, rates cycle down to three and a half or 4%, you could take advantage of the opportunity of refinancing to lower your payment. Okay, good question. Um, okay, let's go ahead. I wanna uh, cover a couple, couple things and we'll get wrapped up and answer any follow-up questions. I mentioned a few times about the consultation. This is what a consultation or how we begin the consultation product process. It's called our get started information. Really simple online application. You'd upload things like your 2020 and 21 W-2s, uh, pay stubs, bank statements. Um, and then um, from that point, our team would work with you to schedule your consultation. And that's where we get a chance to meet with, with me for a one-on-one -on -one to design a home buying plan. Now, after today's discussion, let's say you, you just have some follow-up questions or you want to ask a credit question or maybe more questions around the first-time buyer program, I would encourage you to schedule like an intro call with us. To schedule any one of our variety of, of consultations, you can just click right here on the, uh, on the, the slide here and we'll get you on our calendar. Here's the framework of a personal consultation. We'll talk a little bit about your budget, where you want to purchase, what your, what your credit looks like, what are the interest rate options look like, how's the closing cost going to be structured for my out-of-pocket expenses, and design just this comprehensive plan for you. So whether you want to buy this year, next year, this is a three or four year strategic plan, whatever it might be, we want to make sure you have all the tools that you need to make a good financial investment. Um, I mentioned uh, the calculator earlier this evening. Um, so if you want to do some payment calculations, our mobile app is fantastic for that. You can actually even apply right through the mobile app to start your journey towards home ownership. And we have some great community partnerships um, with some local universities. And the benefit for um, some of our alumni that, um, that are affiliated with those schools is we have a discount program. And so that allows us to discount our, our, our closing costs by $750. Our, our school partnerships have grown quite a bit this year and really excited to partner with all these fantastic universities. Um, and you know, part of those benefits include some other workshops that we provide to some of those uh, schools. Here's our upcoming workshop schedule. So if you like some of this information, you thought this might be really informative for another family member or a coworker or a friend, have them come check out our workshops. We're gonna be teaching another class uh, tomorrow night. Uh, that's kind of really exclusive for our USC group, but we'll have another one for the LA markets next week. Um, and we have these classes, like I said, every couple of weeks. So check us out at mortgageeducate.com. Here's all my contact information. So if you wanna reach out to me after tonight's session and you know ask any questions, I'm more than happy to help you with that. And we have um, uh, you know, the opportunity to schedule some calls if that's a little easier for you. As I mentioned earlier, we're gonna be posting a lot of great updates on our social channels like Instagram. So as the California Dream for All program rolls out, really encourage you to follow us on Instagram. Uh, we try to put really good content out there at least two or three times a week. And we love what our clients are saying about us. So check us out on our Google reviews and Yelp reviews. I mean, that's that's a huge testament to what we're trying to do in our communities to help with home ownership. In fact, a lot of our testimonials are from, you know, students that attended classes just like you're doing this evening. So we're really proud of what our community is saying about us in home ownership. So with that said, I, I really appreciate all of you joining tonight's discussion. Hopefully you found it informative. Um, we're right at seven o'clock. I did pretty good on my timing, but I do want to stick around uh, for some for some questions to, to wrap up tonight. So please feel free to, to send me a question and I'll answer those on the air and make sure that you get all the information that you need this evening. Okay, so a question came in about, do you have any workshops for refinancing options? Uh, great question. We've had refinancing workshops. In fact, we did some uh, over the last couple of years. Um, I think that really depends on, on demand out there. I mean, as you can imagine, refinancing has changed quite a bit given the, the, right, the rate climate, but certainly we'll, we'll bring those back um, in, in, the, in the upcoming year, I would imagine.
So a uh, question came in uh, for the offers that do not offer forgiveness. So some of the assistance programs that don't offer forgiveness, is it possible to pay it off later or is this money borrowed forever attached to the house? So great question. So for the My Home Assistance Program, it's not forgiven as you learned earlier. Um, it has a 1% simple interest rate uh, attached to it. You can pay it off as early as you want to. If you decide never to pay on it, it just comes fully due at the end of 30 years. But it's 1% interest, so it's really cheap. But if it's something you just want to get paid off sooner, you can totally do that. Thanks for the question. That was a good one. Okay, we got a few more people in the classroom. Let's see. Any other questions out there? I got one more that came in. Uh, so the question is, the Equity Builder Program won't be available next year. So it's really hard to say on the timing of, of how long the funds are going to last. I think it's going to just be dependent on how, how quickly, you know, uh, these funds uh, go down. What I've been told from our contacts at Cal HFA is it could last through the end of the year, possibly into next year. So it's really kind of an unknown. Um, as I mentioned earlier, follow us on our social channels because we're going to be posting updates. As I hear from Cal HFA, I'll definitely uh, broadcast that information to you as well. Um, we're the leading provider at Cal HFA, so we, we're very fortunate to um, have some great partners at Cal HFA. So I do, as I try to get information, as I get information, I try to share that with our community as much as possible. And you're welcome. Thanks for joining the class. Okay. Well, I think, I think that brings us to an end. I want to thank everybody for joining us tonight. Um, if you do have any other questions, please feel free to reach out to me and hopefully I get a chance to connect with each of you to help build your own home buying game plan.